Hello guys, this is John Hashmat and this is a video for A2 physics for the CAE examinations. In this video, I'll be talking about magnetic fields, the types of questions that you may encounter in the final exam and how to deal with them. So let's get started. First of all, you need to identify the shapes and directions of the magnetic fields and the definition of a magnetic field. So basically, a magnetic field is a region where a magnetic material would experience a force, a magnetic material like iron, steel, cobalt, or nickel. And it's also a region where a charged moving particle will experience a force. That means a current inside the conductor or just an electron moving or any charged particle moving inside this field, it will experience a force. And the force is defined to be moving away from North Pole like so, and towards the south. That's the direction of the magnetic field. It's defined as to be out of a North Pole and into a South Pole. But that's a simple type of field that's filled around our bar magnet. You, so you know North Pole where it is and where is the South Pole and you can just draw a simple direction. But what if you have a current, a wire carrying a current, it also creates a magnetic field around it. So the way to know the direction of the magnetic field is using the right hand grip rule. And it's used, used as follows. If you have a straight wire, then you would point with your right hand thumb in the direction of the current in the straight wire and your finger will, uh, fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field. So this is the current and we'll call the magnetic field B for now. So for a straight wire, the thumb of the right hand points in the direction of the current and the fingers curl around in the direction of the magnetic field, which means that the magnetic field will be a circular field or a curved field. If you're dealing with a coil or a solenoid, the wire is curled around, so the current is a circular part. So your fingers will point in the direction of the current and your thumb will be pointing in the direction of the field. So it would be somehow straight. The magnetic field will be somehow straight inside a solenoid or a coil. So how to use the right hand grip rule in situations like circuits or a wire connected to a battery. A straight wire connected to a battery, uh, you'll find that the current is defined to go out of a positive terminal of a battery and towards the negative terminal of the battery. So if you point your right hand with the thumb pointing down in this direction from X to Y, that's the direction of the current, you'll find that your fingers are curling clockwise so you'll draw concentric circles with their directions shown clockwise there is also a small detail here you're required to mind the spacing between the field lines or the flux lines and show that the spacing is increasing away from the wire that shows that the magnetic field is getting weaker as you go away from the source of the magnetic field which is a current inside the wire. So what happens if you reverse the battery? The current goes down, going from Y to X. So it's upwards in this case. So you would point, you would point your thumb upwards. You'll find that your fingers are curling anti-clockwise. So the arrows would be in the opposite direction. And still you mind the distance or the separation between the flux lines showing that the field is getting weaker away from the wire. So basically, if you reverse the current in a conductor, you reverse the direction of the magnetic field. If the conductor is a straight wire, then the magnetic field is concentric circles around the wire. By the way, the magnetic field is not just in the middle section of the wire, it's all along the wire. It's not just in this area, 
So you would have a cylindrical magnetic field around a straight wire. Okay, so let's move on to the solenoid and how to find the magnetic field of the solenoid. Basically, a solenoid would have a, a magnetic field very similar to the magnetic field of a bar magnet, but it's a little bit elongated, and you can actually see the magnetic field, field line or flux lines inside the solenoid. For bar magnets, you cannot see the magnetic field inside the bar magnet because it's solid, but in a solenoid, you can actually uh, throw some iron fillings in there and you uh, it would take the shape of the magnetic field or the flux inside the solenoid so let's go and see how the current flows so basically the current is going in this direction it's going up from behind and coming out of the page from the top and into the page from the bottom. So if you curl your hand in the direction of the current, you will find that the magnetic field will be pointing towards the right. So the direction is out of the right side and into the left side. But how can you determine the North Pole and the South Pole of the solenoid? That's very easy. If you remember from a bar magnet, the magnetic field is always pointing away from a north pole and into a south pole. So the right side where the magnetic field is going out of the solenoid is the north pole of the solenoid and the other side is the south pole of the solenoid. So what happens again if you reverse the current? By reversing the battery, the current here is going into the page from the top and out of the page from the bottom. So if you curl your hands in the direction of the current, you'll find that the thumb is pointing to the left in this situation. So going out of the solenoid from the left side and into the solenoid from the, from the right side. So you have a south pole on the right and a north pole on the left. So, and that's how you use the right hand grip rule to identify the direction of the magnetic field or the current inside a solenoid or a straight wire. Okay. Now we come to a certain difficulty when dealing with 3D images. In 3D dimensions, you can draw a simple right and left by drawing horizontal axes. So a horizontal arrow can point simply right and left. A vertical axis would point simply up and down or up the page or down the page. If there is an inclined arrow or axis towards the top of the page, that means that it's going into the page. If there is an arrow pointing inclined towards the bottom of the page, that's out of the page. So basically you have two examples here. On the left here, you have a current coming out of the page. So you would point the thumb of your right hand out of the page. You'll find that your, your fingers are curling anti-clockwise. So you would draw concentric circles around this wire pointing anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. If you have a current which is going into the page, you would uh, you'd point your thumb into the page and you'll find that your fingers are curling clockwise so you draw concentric circles pointing clockwise also keep in mind the spacing between the field lines or the flux lines they must always be increasing okay for any field there is something called a field strength or the flux strength for magnetic fields we call the flux density or uh, the field strength flux density and is denoted by the symbol B and its unit is the Tesla. Okay, but what's the definition of the flux density or the magnetic field strength? For a gravitational field, the field strength is a force per unit mass. For an electric field, it is a force per unit 
charge, but you don't have something called unit magnet here. So we can just define uh, the flux density as the number of lines flowing per unit area. For example, if you have a North Pole, like the one shown on the left here, you would see that the flux lines are going somehow like this out of the North Pole in curves, and eventually they will reach the South Pole. This is just one part of the magnetic field. So the flux lines are pointing away from the field in curves, and the spacing between the flux lines is increasing. So if you have two identical areas here, you would find that the number of lines in the area on the left is five lines in this area, and the number of lines on the right is only three lines. That means that the flux density on the left-hand side is greater than the flux density on the right-hand side, which means that the force here is greater and the force here is weaker. Okay, so let's move on to a deeper definition of flux density just by using the force on a conductor. So you also uh, may remember from your IGCSEs that if you place a wire carrying a current, for example, connected here to a positive voltage and here to a negative voltage, if you have a current flowing inside the magnetic field, which is here pointing, to the right from north to south this wire would experience a force and this force is in a direction which is perpendicular to the magnetic flux and perpendicular to the current the reason that you have a force is that you have two magnetic fields superimposing on a, on over each other so the wire has the circular magnetic field And the magnets or the magnetic poles have their uniform magnetic field. And those two fields are superimposed over each other. Whenever you have two magnetic fields superimposed on each other, you experience a force due to variation in the flux density in different areas. So in which direction is this force? So the way you know the direction of the, uh, of the force is Fleming's left-hand rule. How to use Fleming's left-hand rule? Simply by pointing three fingers, the thumb, the first finger or the index finger, and the middle finger in perpendicular directions. So you have the thumb pointing, in this case, vertically, index finger to the right, and the middle finger is pointing out of the page. So let's apply this to the case above. You have the magnetic field pointing to the right. So basically the first finger is the magnetic field. The thumb is pointing towards the motion or the force. And the middle finger is the current. Or uh, as one of my colleagues, colleagues called it, F, B, I. So, the thumb is a force, the first finger is a magnetic field, the current, uh, the middle finger is the current. So, if you apply this to the image above, you would find that for a field pointing to the right and the current coming out of the page, the wire would experience an upwards force and the wire would start moving upwards until it goes out of the magnetic field. Then the two magnetic fields will no longer be superimposed and the force will no longer be there. So how to use the Fleming's left-hand rule in different situations? For example, here you have the two poles oriented in the same uh, direction. So the field is still to the right. But you may notice that the current has reversed its direction. Instead of pointing out of the page, it's pointing into the page, which means that you would have to point the first finger to the right, but you have to 
change the orientation of your middle finger to be pointing into the page, you would find that the thumb is pointing now downwards. So this wire will experience a downwards force instead of upwards. So basically, if you reverse the current, you reverse the force. Okay, what then if you if you've reversed the flux direction instead of the current? So you'd still have the current pointing out of the page, but the magnetic field now is pointing to the left. You would find that it's very difficult for you to point your hand uh, your left hand to the left and still be inside the paper or within the your working area. So what you do is you can just flip the whole page or the exam paper. So for me here, I'll just select uh, the image of drone and I'll just flip it for you. You'd rotate the whole book or the exam paper. So I'm flipping it. Flipping it 900, 90 degrees, and another 90 degrees. Okay. So now the field is pointing to the right. And I remember that the current was out of the page, so I would just keep my middle finger out of the page, pointing out of the page. And now the magnetic field is easy. It's to the right. And the force is pointing upwards. So I would just draw the direction of the force upwards before I return the page to, re to just reserve what I've done. And now I can return to its original orientation. I rotated 90 degrees, then 90 degrees, and voila. Now the force is downwards. So Basically, if you reverse the current or the flux without reversing the other one, you still get a reversed force. Okay, so what happens if you reverse the current and then reverse the flux? Basically, you're reversing two times, so you would get the same direction of the force. So, for, for example, in this uh, in this orientation, you have the field is pointing towards the right. If you reverse it to the left, you'd get a downward force. And the current was pointing out of the page. If you reverse the current after reversing the field, the force will be reversed again. So you'd still have an upwards force. Okay, another, uh, another type of image that you may get is a field going into the page like the one shown on the left here. Here you have a north pole towards yourself and a south pole in the depth of the page. So the field is going into the page. What you would do is you point your first finger into the page. If the current is pointing to the right, you'd find that you would expect to get an upward force. If the current is moving to the left, you would get a downwards force and still the field is pointing into the page. Okay, what if the field is parallel to the page, upwards? So here you have a North Pole on the bottom, a South Pole on the top, so the field is going upwards. So you would point your first finger up the page or parallel to the page. If the current is going to the left, then the force is going into the page. If your, car, if your current is going to the right, then the force is coming out of the page. Your thumb is pointing out of the page. Here your thumb was pointing into the page. So these are some examples of how to use uh, the Fleming's left hand rule. You can pause the video now and go back uh, and try to orient yourself or get familiar with how to use or rotate your hands in different positions. And whenever you feel that uh, it's difficult for you to rotate your hand. Just uh, flip the page or rotate the page until you uh, you feel comfortable with using uh, the Fleming's left hand. Uh, you can also experience with different orientations shown here and how to uh, draw 
the magnetic field or the current or the force in any direction. Now let's move on to the next part. So we said that there is a force on a conductor inside a magnetic field. Now let's see how to calculate the force or what parameters affect the force. We basically said that this force is due to interaction between two magnetic fields. One is due to the magnetic field of the poles, which has a flux density B, so the force must be proportional to the flux density. The stronger the magnetic field, the stronger the force the conductor will experience. And also, it depends on the magnetic field due to the current inside the conductor. So, if the current increases, its flux around it increases, and that increases the strength of the force. So the force is also proportional to the current inside the conductor. Uh, if you imagine uh, the area between the magnetic poles, you have a box here where the flux is the strongest, and outside this region, the flux gets significantly weaker. So this is the region where you experience a uniform magnetic field due to the poles. So this region will have the greatest effect of the force. And there are forces all along the wire in this region. In this case, the forces will be pointing upwards using the Fleming's left-hand rule. And outside this region, you will find that there is almost no force acting on the wire. There is still some force, but the magnetic field is too weak, so the force will be negligible outside the range. So the length of the wire inside the magnetic field also affects the strength of the force. So we will add here that the force is proportional to the length of the wire inside the magnetic field. If you combine these factors, you'll find that the force is equal to the flux density multiplied by the current and length of conductor inside the magnetic field. Uh, we usually like to call this uh, bill, so the force is equal to bill, uh, but this is not the only thing that affects the force. If the flux is in a direction and the current is perpendicular to that direction, you'll find that the force will be maximum. In this case, the force will be upwards and you'll experience the maximum force. But if the flux is in a certain direction and the current is parallel to that direction, either to the right or to the left here, you'll find that no force is exerted on the wire. So we need to add to this equation a, a mathematical formula that will express that the force is maximum when the angle is 90 degrees between the current and the flux, and the force is zero when uh, the current is parallel to the flux. This function is a sine function. So we will add here sine theta, which represents the angle between the current and the magnetic field. So this is how you calculate force. B is always in Tesla, I is in amperes, L is in meters, to get the force in Newton. These are all the SI base, uh, base units of, uh, not base, uh, the SI units of all the parameters, the flux density, uh, current, length, and force. This equation leads to a deeper understanding of the flux density. So, we will use this equation to find out another definition for the flux density. We'll mention that the flux density is the number of lines per unit area, but it's basically not something that you can actually measure. So we will use this equation to help us with measuring the flux density or uh, finding a magnitude for the flux density. So if you place the flux density as the, uh, the subject of the formula, you'll find that the flux density is equal to the force over the current multiplied by the length multiplied by sine the angle between current and flux but what if you place the flux perpendicular to the current or the current perpendicular to the flux now sine theta becomes sine 90. in this case the flux density will be equal to the force over only the current multiplied by the length of wire inside the magnetic field if the length of the conductor is one meters, one meter, and the magnitude of the current uh, it's carrying is one ampere, you'll find that the flux de density is equal to the force 
So you can define the flux density by using the equation for the force on a conductor. So it is a force acting on a conductor of unit length placed at right angles to the magnetic field and carrying a current of one ampere. Same thing can be used to define the Tesla. So one Tesla is one Newton acting on a conductor of unit length carrying a current of one ampere placed at right angles to the field. Okay, now let's go to the next part. There is something called a current balance. Usually we use an ammeter to measure the current inside any conductor. So what if you don't have an ammeter and you have a magnet instead and you know the flux density of the magnet? So that's known. Uh, if the magnet shown on the right here has, a, uh, has the poles as oriented here, then the flux is pointing to the right, so from north to south. If you're carrying a current outside of the page, then this, uh, this conductor here will experience a force upwards using the Fleming's left-hand rule. So this is a force on the wire. So if the magnet causes an upward force on the wire, then the magnet will experience a downwards force as a result of this force. So basically, that's the force on the magnet, and it's downwards according to Newton's third law. If an object acts with a force on another object, then the second object will experience a force in the opposite direction. So what if you use a balance to measure the change in weight? You'll find that the change in W is equal to the force on the wire, which we said is equal to B I L sine theta, but the angle here is 90 degrees, so you'll just leave it to F is equal to build. So you can actually measure the change in weight of the magnet. The magnet will press harder on the balance, so it will read an increase in weight. So you know the flux density uh, of the magnet uh, or the magnetic poles of the horseshoe magnet shown. You can easily measure the length of the conductor inside the magnetic field using a ruler. So you're only left with current and you can calculate it from this equation. So this is how you can measure the current using a magnet and a balance. Up until now, we were talking about two magnetic fields, uh, one from a current and one from a magnet. But what happens if you place two wires with currents right next to each other? Uh, on the left here, I'm showing two uh, wires, one carrying a current down the page, that's a blue wire, say that the current is I1, if you apply the right hand uh, uh, grip rule, you will find that this wire is creating a clockwise magnetic field around it. If you apply the right hand grip rule to the second wire, the red one, which is carrying current I2, you'll find that it's also creating a clockwise magnetic field around it. So you still have two, uh, two magnetic fields interacting, which means that these wires will experience equal and opposite forces. Same thing with the magnet and uh, the conductor with the current balance. So if I take a look from the top of the page, if I'm looking downwards on the wires, I will find that the current is going into the page. So I'm going to draw this here. So if I draw the current in, uh, in the red wire, I can represent the current going into the page, but by simply drawing an X here. So this current is creating a magnetic field, and the magnetic field is circular and pointing clockwise. So on the left side, the magnetic field will be pointing upwards, but this is where the other wire exists. So this wire, the blue wire, is also carrying a current into the page, and it's creating its own circular magnetic field, and it's also pointing clockwise. But on the right side here, it's causing a downwards magnetic field on the red wire. So each wire is inside the magnetic field of the other wire. If you apply Fleming's left-hand rule here, 
you will find the, that you're having a current into the page. So your first finger is pointing into the page and the magnetic flux due to the blue wire is pointing downwards. So a current inside the magnetic field, it will experience a force. If you use the Fleming's left hand rule, you will find that the red wire will experience a force to the left. Applying the same left hand rule to the, the blue wire, you will find that there is a current into the page. So first finger pointing into the page. The flux due to the red wire is pointing upward this time. So your, uh, your first finger, sorry, uh, your middle finger is pointing inwards. Your first finger is pointing upwards. You'll find that the thumb is pointing to the right. So basically, if you place two conductors with currents parallel to each other and in the same direction, these wires will experience an attractive force. And this is due to the interaction between the two magnetic fields. But what happens if you reverse the direction of one of the currents? Here, the blue wire is still carrying a current downwards and still creating a clockwise magnetic field. But now the, the red wire is carrying a current upwards. Using the right hand grip rule, you'll find that it's creating a counterclockwise magnetic field. So if I draw the, the red wire now with a current going, sorry, uh, it's now going out of the page. I can represent the current going out of the page with a dot and a circle. And it's creating a circular magnetic field. But now it's counterclockwise. So on the left here, the field is pointing downwards where the blue wire exists. So if I draw the blue wire now with its current going into the page, it's still creating a clockwise circular magnetic field and on the right the field will be pointing downwards. Again, using Fleming's left hand rule, on the red wire, the current is pointing out of the page. So the middle finger should be pointing out of the page the flux due to the blue wire is pointing downwards. So the first finger should be pointing downwards. You will find that the force will be to the right. Now, using Fleming's left hand rule with the blue wire, the current is pointing inwards. So the middle finger pointing into the page. The field is pointing downwards. So the first finger pointing downwards. You'll find that the thumb will be pointing to the left. So whenever you place two wires with opposite currents, they will experience a repulsive force. And this is also due to interaction between two magnetic fields, one from each wire. But what are the magnitudes of these forces? Basically, these forces are equal and opposite in direction according to Newton's third law. But the forces depend on the magnetic fields and the magnetic fields are induced by the currents, so the forces must be proportional to the currents, and they're also and uh, this also proportional to the length of the wire, as long as they are parallel. But what happens if you increase the separation between the wires? If you call the separation between the wires A here, you find that the force is inversely proportional to A, since the further away you get from the current, the weaker its field becomes, which means that the further away you get, uh, this wire will experience a lower force since the flux density will be less. So this is how you can get a sense of the magnitude of the force on each wire. And we said before that these forces are equal and opposite in direction as an action and reaction.